Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about different graphical descriptive methods for displaying quantitative data. Okay, so we've we've seen before that there's certain methods that only work for certain types of data, right? So we've seen some categorical methods before. There there were only a handful of things there. All right, but there's going to be a lot more methods for quantitative data. Okay, and a lot of these methods that we see for quantitative data, one may, each have their pros and cons. Right? One may highlight certain aspects of the data, if you happen to be interested in that. Some might highlight others. Okay, so here's a list of all the different methods that we're going to talk about. Stem plots, or stem and leaf plots, dot plots, histograms, line graphs, frequency polygons, and then time series plots. Okay, so let's start here with stem plots or stem and leaf plots. All right, so this is a pretty elementary type thing, but it is useful. So the idea is we've got some sort of numerical data, right? And this the number must have a way to intuitively divide it up into what we call our stem and our leaf. Right? Our leaf is our rightmost digit, our smallest digit. So for example, if we had the number 173, we might use 170 as our stem, 3 as our leaf. So an example of that might look something like this. We've looked at a data set before. It was the, the highest temperature ever recorded in each of the 50 states. Okay, And we'll look later in the application video about exactly how to do this in certain softwares. But and sort of just try to interpret them, note some pros and cons, that kind of thing. All right, so here's my stem and leaf plot of the highest temperature ever recorded in each of the 50 states. All right, so we look, we see that um, our stems and our leaves are broken up kind of interestingly here. Okay, so rather than taking the 100s, the 110s, the 120s, the 130s, we broke it up into 100 to 105, 100 to 1, or 105 to 109, and so forth. All right, so this is our stem and leaf plot. And this, this is a plot that comes from software Minitab. All right, so it, we can see from our stem and leaf plot, it gives us a pretty good look, overall look at the data, quickly and easily sorts our data. I can easily see just some basic summary statistics like my maximum, my minimum, could derive my range from that. Um, my mode all right, would be really easy to find from this. Okay, so stem and leaf plot is pretty basic, but it does have its uses. All right, so as we saw in that last example, just some kind of side notes here. As we saw in that last example, our stem and leaf plot was split into each stem was split into like an o, a lower and upper stem. Okay, and back to back stem plots are a really nice comparison tool. Right? If we have similar data sets and we can sort them out with the same stems, compare them back to back, that, that can be something kind of cool. Okay, so overall stem and leaf plots that quickly and easily sort our data. And also you can see each data point. You can see each observation. Right, we have the actual numbers right there in front of us. So that's nice. But some disadvantages, as you might guess, a stem and leaf plot gets pretty messy if we have large data sets. Right? And our we can split our stems kind of like we talked about, but we don't have a ton of flexibility there. Okay, so those are our pros and cons of a stem and leaf plot. Let's move on to a dot plot. All right, the idea of a dot plot is we draw a number line and we just put a little dot for each observation. If we have repeated observations, we start stacking the dots. Okay, so again, dot plot, pretty straightforward. Let's look at a dot plot, again, of these 50 states, the highest temperature recorded in each of our 50 states. So you're going to start seeing a pattern. We're going to look at all these different methods 
and we're going to look at visualizations of the same data here. We're going to keep looking at this high temperature data over and over. Okay, so here is a dot plot of that. All right, so some things we can take away. Now our stem and leaf plot, we had the actual numbers. With the dot plot, we have to do a little bit of work to see the numbers. We can see where that dot falls on the number line. Um, the dot plot, I think, also gives us a little bit better look at how, how spread out our data might be. Um, it gives us a little bit better look, I think, at the, the overall distribution. Um, in this specific dot plot, we kind of see some points that are sticking out to us here. And these points didn't really stick out with our, our stem plot. Okay, so the dot plot's nice for a lot of reasons there. Right? We still get to see our individual data points. We can get a pretty good look at the shape. And it can really help us see points that stand out more so than some other methods. We're going to see our disadvantage if, if you had a large data set. Dot plot could turn into a mess. And for whatever reason, dot plots just aren't that commonly seen. All right, our most common visual method that we see a lot is called our histogram. Okay, what a histogram is, is essentially a two-dimensional frequency table. All right now, you, we've talked about frequency tables already. Okay, so we take this idea of, of making groups or making intervals. In the context of a histogram, they're more likely called bins or classes. All right, and then instead of just listing the frequencies or relative frequencies in a table, we draw a little bar over top of those bins or classes. The bigger the bar, the higher the frequency. Okay, so now we've seen for categorical data, we've seen bar charts before. So a lot of people just want to call a histogram a bar chart. But remember, these are two different tools. They display different kinds of data. Um, one way I can tell which one is which right off the bat, right? a histogram the bars should touch. Right? And I have to carefully divide up these, these bins. Right? Categorical data, the bars don't touch. Um, not as much thought. You, you don't have to put thought into how to divide it up because categorical data is already divided into categories. All right, so let's look at a histogram of this same data. The histogram we see looks like it gives us a really good look at the shape of this distribution. Right now obviously we're losing specific data points, right? But we've got a really good look at the overall shape here with our histogram. Okay? It can handle any size data set, so some of the pros, it can handle any size data set that you throw at it and it gives us a really good look at the shape. The disadvantage is though we're losing our individual values. And what we've seen before, there are good best practices for binning, but you can kind of play around with your bins, play around with your classes, and make a histogram sort of look anything like you want it to. Okay, so our next method that we're going to look at are called line graphs. Okay, line graphs are used when we have some sort of typically discrete data or maybe even ordinal data in a frequency table. Okay, we take the values of the data and put that on our x-axis. We put the frequencies on the y-axis. Right, then make little dots where those intersect and connect it with a line. Okay, so it's really useful for seeing kind of maybe trends in discrete data or trends in ordinal data, something like that not useful for continuous data. We'll see how we how we work with this with continuous data in a minute. Okay, so our our data set that we had been working with, the high temperatures, um, it, it's, it was continuous data, right? It's a measurement. So it's not the best for a line graph. So we're going to look at a different frequency distribution here. So let's say we've got data like this. The number of movies people have watched in the last week. 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And we have their associated frequencies. So if we have a frequency table like this, we can then translate it to a line graph. We can kind of see what's what's most common. One movie over the course of a week, zero movies, two movies, and so forth. So our line graph, the pros here are that 
super easy to read. Um, I don't think you have to take a class to read something, a graph like that. I'm sure most people have seen that before. All right, but we have to have data in a format that it's, it's grouped in some sort of frequency table or in discrete data. It doesn't work well for continuous data. Okay, so what if we want to apply this idea of a line graph to continuous data? Well, that's where these things called frequency polygons come in. Okay, so a frequency polygon is when we have continuous data that's been put into a frequency table format. So it's been divided into groups, it's been divided into intervals. And we basically apply what we did with a line graph, and we take that frequency table and make a line graph with it. That's the idea here. Okay, so frequency polygon, we can do that for this high temperature data. All right, but so we've seen a frequency table before of this high temperature data, and we take that frequency table, apply the ideas of a line graph, and make it look something like this. So it should look fairly similar to your histogram, but it's just presented in a slightly different format. Okay, so just one more kind of side note on frequency polygons. Now, some another use for those, or a higher use for frequency polygons, oftentimes we talked about how histograms, you can play around with the bin sizes, and you can almost make histograms deceptive in some cases. Okay, so, and it can be very hard to compare two histograms to each other side by side, right? Because you might have different sized bins, you might have kind of a different structure of data. Um, and to overlay two histograms, it, it can look kind of ugly. But a comparative frequency polygon, if we make, if we have two groups of data and we overlay them together, it can be a really useful tool for comparison. Okay, so I want to look at a compilation here with the same data set we've been using, all the different visualization methods that we've discussed here. All right, we've got a frequency table of our data here in the top left. We've got a stem and leaf plot, dot plot, histogram, frequency polygon. All right, so oftentimes when we're displaying data, maybe we can only use one of these, right? But lots of times they, they go well together and they complement each other, right? So like in my dot plot, I kind of saw some points that stuck out over here, right? But those points kind of got lost in a histogram sort of got lost in a stem and leaf plot. Stem and leaf plot, I can see my actual numbers. Histogram, I can't. But if you kind of look at this stem and leaf plot and imagine rotating it 90 degrees, it looks very, very similar to a histogram. Okay, my frequency polygon, that can be useful in some applications as well. Maybe it's, it looks a little nicer, maybe a little cleaner than some of these other options. All right, the last thing we want to talk about here are time series plots. Okay, a time series plot is where we actually have two variables going on, and one of them, a time series plot, is where we have a variable and we want to see how it's trending over time. All right, so with a time series plot, your x-axis will always be some increment of time, or your y-axis is your variable of interest. Okay, so for example, we have the sales of some item over the years. All right, so they're pretty simple to read and pretty simple to interpret. Right, we see the sales of this item up and down, but overall going up over time. So these are very useful to, to look at trending data. But one note we want to make on time series plots here are the increments of time used. Okay, you, time series plots can be over any sort of increment of time. The last one we looked at was over years. Then if you can imagine taking the same item, the same sales of the same item, and kind of zooming in on quarterly data, right? even though we see sales rising steadily over time, looking at the yearly data here, quarterly we see a very distinct cyclical pattern. The point here is, depending on the increment of time that we're looking at, we can definitely see some different types of trends. Okay, so those are all of our methods that we're looking at, going back to 
stem plot, dot plot, histogram, line plot, frequency polygon, and finally our time series plot. These are all methods for, for new, graphically summarizing quantitative data. Okay, so thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.